Hello. Accord chair. My name is Jesse Desplat, Jean-Christophe Desplat, uh, the director of the Irish Center for High-End Computing. So I will start by the usual announcements regarding health and safety. In the, in the very unlikely event of a fire emergency, uh, you will notice that just like in planes, uh, the exit could be behind you. So you have the two doors behind you here and the door here uh, in case of emergency, please do as, uh, as needed and exit the building. So it is a real pleasure for me to be here in front of you today. And I think I'm actually quite emotional, uh, I think, because uh, these 10 years of, of iCheck, the Irish Center for High-End Computing, have been a little bit of a, a roller coaster for our organization. But I think it's a very joyous occasion for us. I think I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to say uh, that uh, myself and my team are particularly proud to do our very best to contribute to the Irish economy, to Irish society, uh, to always remember the reason why we have been established is to make a difference, okay? So we are really motivated to make a difference in terms of outcome, in terms of societal impact, economic impact. Uh, and, you know, this is true whether we deal with industry, with academia, or with the public sector. So in relation to this, we have produced this small commemorative booklet, uh, which selected 10 stories. I picked out 10, I could have been 20, but you know, we had to stick to the theme, which is 10 years of eye check, 10 stories of innovations. And tomorrow morning, we are going to give uh, an overview. We have invited our partners to tell their own story, the story of their collaboration with eye check from their own perspective. Okay, so those of you who have time, I would strongly uh, suggest that you, you join us. We are at the Institute of Chartered Accountants on, on Pier Street. It promises to be a very interesting uh, half day of events. More importantly, I was absolutely delighted, absolutely delighted when our friends from the European Commission, from DigiConnect, uh, defined their policies, their strategy, and recognize the truly transformative nature of high performance computing and its relevance to, uh, in terms of economic impact and societal impact. I'm absolutely delighted. So after reading these communications and these policy documents, I say, wouldn't it be fantastic to get the man at the top, to get Director General Roberto Viola to come and tell us in person, actually, his own opinion on HPC, its value to society, and the world policy framework uh, that has been put in place by the Commission to support the development of high performance computing. Of course, I do appreciate, Director, that it's only a small part of your overall brief, so I'm, I'm certain you will also cover other, other areas. But I, I speak too much already, so I leave it for now, and I would like you to give, uh, first of all, a few minutes of attention to a short video that outlines uh, basically how far our organization has gone over the past 10 years and after Director General Roberto Viola will follow this video with, oh, sorry, one last point before I get myself in trouble here. It's very important for me to, to thank our, the people without whom we wouldn't exist, that's the Department of Jobs, Enterprise Innovation, the Department of Education and Skills, the Higher Education Authority, Science Foundation Ireland for the capital investment, uh, but also Enua Galway, who are our, our academic hosts. So without those organizations and their support, uh, our center wouldn't be today the success story that it is. So thank you. I think it's a very good occasion for me to say thank you to all. Video, please. My name is Jean-Christophe Desplat, director of the Irish Center for High End Computing. Welcome to our 10th anniversary. I would like to congratulate iCheck to the 10th anniversary. They have provided essential high performance computing support to the academic community in Ireland. And I think they would deserve a big cake, uh, perhaps with 1,200 candles for each of the projects they supported in the past 10 years. Well, praise is important because the really top-end computing resources can only be provided on a continental scale. 
And until I checked joint praise eight years ago, Irish researchers really had no access to these world-leading facilities. Since then, however, we've had access to something like 2.7 million euros worth of computing time. Our involvement uh, with uh, iCheck uh, started off when we were doing some climate modelling several years ago. We didn't have the computer resources and we found it very convenient uh, to uh, deal with iCheck to get those computer resources. We were impressed with the level of service that uh, we got and that led into uh, using the resources for our operational forecasting. The oil and gas exploration and production business is a very complex environment to work in involves acquiring huge amount of data. We need to collaborate with, a, with an organisation such as iCheck because we need to draw on their computational skills and their people. Oil and gas exploration and production is a long-term investment and we expect our collaboration with iCheck to be a long-term investment. We've recently developed a point-of-care diagnostic for cardiovascular disease monitoring based on platelet function testing iCheck's contribution to this work has been to develop the software interface for the platform and to help us to analyse the data the device produces. Having completed the clinical evaluation, we are now working to commercialise this technology in collaboration with iCheck. iCheck joined our global Intel Parallel Computing Centre programme. It's a competitive programme at a global level and iCheck were selected because of their exceptional parallel software skills and their problem-solving approach to HPC and big data challenges. The emergence of new data sources presents complex challenges for our customers who demand high performance. Our partnership with iCheck is strategic to enable us to deliver performance to our customers. I have no doubt that other Irish-based and international-based businesses could successfully benefit from engaging with iCheck. On an international dimension, CSO and iCheck have come together as part of a United Nations-led initiative around the modernisation of statistical systems. On a national level, iCheck are assisting us through training initiatives and workshops and helping us to upgrade the data skills across the public sector. We track all of the world's news content. So our customers want to know what are going to be the big news stories each day, the big events each day. So we wanted to look at how good that method is. And the amount of data is so big that we needed computing power and statistical brain power, and that's where iCheck came in. iCheck is a diverse organization with staff drawn from over 12 countries worldwide who share one thing in common, a passion for high performance computing and innovation. At iCheck we have a really high ambition on how we can drive Ireland's HPC sector. We use our HPC knowledge to provide solutions to some of the world's most challenging problems. The attraction for me for iCheck is that it is open to new ideas and different perspectives. Uh, iCheck gave me the scope to be inventive and to show initiative iCheck is powered by very passionate smart people that think outside the box. You will find shared values and vision across iCheck. iCheck is the bridge between academia and industry. Where else can you play with cutting edge technology? iCheck. Okay, I think once is enough. Uh, Thank you very much for your attention, and we'll place the video on YouTube in, in case you want to have a second, a second look at it. Now, I'd like to invite, it's a great pleasure and honor to invite Director General uh, Roberto Viola uh, to give us a presentation on uh, the relevance of HPC to the economy, and more gen generally, uh, European Commission policy in this domain. Thank you very much. Please give a round of applause for Roberto <laughs> Yeah, Director, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for inviting me to this. That has to be a real celebration for the achievements of iCheck. Now, uh, don't worry, this is not my speech. Eh? Don't get scared. I, I will be absolutely light and, uh, I hope, refreshing. First of all, I have to thank very much iCheck for inviting me. And I must say, the invitation letter was so moving, I would have come anyhow. I mean, it's such an important uh, uh, occasion for HPC in Europe, and in, especially in Ireland, that uh, my presence would have been guaranteed. But the letter was so nice, because the letter started saying, Dear Director General, you are doing very much for the HPC community in Europe, and we are really grateful. Why don't you come and celebrate with us? So I said, yes, of course. 
because indeed, from the very first day I've been appointed Director General, I've been fighting uh, very much for uh, having Europe in the place that deserves to be. Uh, I don't know whether you read my <coughs> blog today, and you need not. So for those of you that did it, uh, I uh, apologize that I repeat what I wrote. So uh, when I was a kid, uh, and maybe some of you are of my age, I was impressed by a movie which is called uh, Fantastic Voyage. Who remembers this movie? Ah, you see. So it's about a group of scientists trying to save another scientist which has been affected by a stroke. And they are miniaturized in a spaceship and injected in a body to arrive to the brain and save the other scientist. Actually, Asimov uh, was committed uh, to, uh, to write a novel which arrived more or less uh, at the same time of the movie. And then he wrote another uh, novel in 88, which is called uh, Destination Brain. So at that time, I have, uh, as a young kid, I had a kind of a split dream. Would I become a neuroscientist or a rocket scientist? Well, I decided to be a rocket scientist, if you read my CV. Uh, but still, I, I remained for many years intrigued about this uh, destination to brain. And now, here I am. I mean, one of the things that DigiConnect does is the Human Brain Project, which is profoundly based on the capacity of HPC. And yesterday, when we had in Parliament the three projects, the brain projects, uh, the US one, uh, uh, the uh, EU one and the Japanese one. I, I told this little story and I was told unanimously, but you don't need to travel anymore to the brain. You have a supercomputer to do that. And there was an animation, indeed, that was zooming in the brain. And I think we are really far still from mapping the human brain and the cells of the human brain. And we don't have yet the supercomputer to do that, the data capacity to do that. But we are getting there. So this fantastic voyage is all about uh, having the capability to understand and the capability to handle and process. Uh, this is, ladies and gentlemen, the new society and economy in the world. Uh, the supercomputers are what? The factories of the future? the data factories of the future, are, let's say, assembling the knowledge, or are they, as the founder of Tesla said, uh, a car of the future is a supercomputer with four wheels? You choose. Or what I have here was a supercomputer 20 years ago. So uh, there are many reasons why Europe has to invest in supercomputing. The reason of uh, really going into the fantastic voyage of breaking the barrier of human knowledge where we don't know things which are very relevant for our society. Having its competitive edge when it comes to the transformation of the economy. Having the possibility to be in the forefront for the new products that will come on the market. And they do come on the market. I remember being a young engineer in the European Space Agency and we were dealing with something very weird called MPEG image compression for space missions. And peg image compression for space missions. You are laughing, but that was his start, what he started. And if you know a little bit of the history of space exploration, you know that, I mean, the first application of image compressions are in the space domain. So what you do in the high-end science, you'll find it with some delay that now starts to be shorter and shorter than in the commercial domain. So. Uh, that's why, I mean, uh, I'm happy to have in my DG, the people working at the digitalization of industry and traditional uh, businesses, together with the people working in HPC, together with the people looking at graphene, and people looking at the human brain, and people looking at the new regulatory setup for Europe. Because you need to be disruptive in a world that changes at the speed of light. And you might say, what supercomputing has to do with populism. I will tell you. Uh, I think we, we are in front of uh, uh, the most beautiful thing that uh, the human being could have dreamed of, uh, which is uh, having access to whatever information, no matter where, no matter what, 
this is fantastic, I mean. And at the same time, uh, we are seeing the, basically, all the mediation of knowledge, being professional journalism, professional science, being disintegrated by this continuous access to the internet. And whatever is on the internet is more trustable than what uh, uh, a respectable journalist or a professor says about science. You know that the number of people that are getting uh, vaccinated in Europe is decreasing because of the news spread on the internet about the danger of vaccinations. But I think the only truth uh, that we have is that 500 million people died of a chicken pox in this century. That's the reality. And there are illnesses that we thought that disappeared from the face of the earth that are coming back. So what has to do with supercomputing? I think we need much more understanding of this complex world. We need much more understanding how knowledge travels around. We need much more understanding what is the interaction between how people absorb knowledge and how they spread knowledge, how they spread things. Uh, there are fascinating things you can do, analyzing, for instance, uh, interaction in social media and inter in analyzing where people are, where people move, which is not Big Brother. Now, uh, I think uh, this uh, really is the answer for many things, which are the challenges of today. Take, for instance, the health sector. Now, we are uh, reaching in Europe what they call the dramatic crossing point, which is when you look at the infraction of GDP, the expenditure for pension, and the expenditure for the health system, we are about to cross it. And the health expenditure is about to overtake expenditure for pensions. It is not yet the, ca the case in some countries, but in some countries we are getting close. And by 2025, probably with the aging population, which is good news, I mean, uh, we live longer, uh, uh, this will be the case. So what is the remedy? I mean, cannot be that we tell people, you know, one of the best things we have in Europe that distinguishes Europe from the rest of the world is welfare state. Now we switch off this welfare state. I think the real answer is technology. I think the real answer is personalized medicine. I think the real answer is to say, look, we, thanks to high-end computing, big data, we are able to link patient records. We will be able to link your genetic information with what we will know about certain illnesses and warn you in advance, I mean, what kind of test, what kind of screening to do. And we will be able to give pharma companies the possibility to have uh, drugs which are targeted maybe to a small group, maybe to you. Uh, I'm not saying that, I mean, we will offer tomorrow a world with, uh, with drugs without side effects, but I think the precision medicine uh, is really becoming a reality. And you don't do precision medicine with an iPad, although I'm a great fan of it. You need to handle big data, and, and you need a lot of supercomputing power. So I don't need to convince you that supercomputing is important, but I think what we need to do together is to convince the, the people that will decide on the future budget in the various member states and in Europe that this is important. So coming back to populism, what is the link? But I think it's a much more credible story that will tell people Thanks to the advancement of technologies, you will have a better service, a cheaper service, and much more uh, possibilities uh, in terms of uh, expectation of life. This is a story which is supported by evidence. It's a story that people understand. In absence of those stories, and in fear that uh, the welfare will disappear, that uh, traditional jobs will disappear, I mean, there are people telling fairy tales, and they believe them. So. I think uh, uh, peop we should not trade people that uh, make choices, also choices we don't like, uh, as people that don't know what they do. I mean, of course, they have their expectations, their fears, and in a society like ours, which is changing so much, as to understand that has to deliver also 
good stories and stories that people understand they are linked with uh, their well-being. So Europe uh, needs badly digital, not only because without a, a digital society and digital economy we will not be competitive in the world, also because we need to pass the message to the citizens that what we do is an advancement that will be going in the right direction. Uh, having autonomous cars and autonomous uh, driving means much less traffic, means less pollution. But it's a tremendous challenge, I mean, in terms of uh, organizing, I mean, uh, the transport system around uh, autonomous vehicles. So that's, we are condemned to work together. No one in Europe can do it alone. And we are happily condemned, both things, uh, to go in the forefront of this fantastic voyage and to break the barrier of what we don't know or what we would like to do with a lot of ambition. I'm not uh, um, willing to compromise on ambition when it comes, for instance, to supercomputing. When we li we s I, I'm always depressed every year when I, list, uh, when I see the, list, the new list of the top 500. I mean, and when I see Europe sliding, of course, some of you in this room are very expert. They can tell me, yeah, but this supercomputer, well, it's not calculated in the right way. It doesn't matter. I mean, the performance of Europe is not exciting. And I think Europe ought to be in the place one or two, three, you choose, of the top supercomputing powers of the world. This is the place we deserve for what we do for the world and for what, I mean, we all to do for our citizens. And of course we do have a mission because when we do something in the human brain or we do something big data for agriculture, it's not only for the Europeans, we do it for a better world, like space exploration, I mean. So again and again, uh, nothing can really seriously done in, in, in the digital society, in a society that is using data as a source of knowledge and transformation without having a world class computing infrastructure. But we, I think we should have also a European way of doing this. Uh, I don't think that the building a supercomputer somewhere in Europe as a big cathedral and going there in sort of uh, pilgrimage and uh, admire it uh, is going to be uh, solving the, the challenges we just discussed. I think the strength of, of uh, Europe and the 10 year of your activity is a demonstration, is the cooperation, is the fact that we are capable to link uh, supercomputing centers, to work together, to create a team, to create an ecosystem. And the experience of praise is extremely, extremely positive. Where praise is falling short is that doesn't have enough supercomputing capacity for all the demand that is out there. Where Praise is falling short is that uh, it needs much more funding, much more support from Europe. So, but the experience of uh, supercomputing centers, uh, such as the one today we celebrate, uh, it's an excellent experience. And we need not now to invent the uh, sort of uh, supercomputing center of the supercomputing centers and need to not to, let's say, wipe out this experience. On the contrary, I think we need to federate all the supercomputing centers in Europe to work even more together. And it doesn't matter whether this uh, uh, exascale computer or two exascale or three that we want to build is located in country A, B, or C. It should be networked and utilized by every scientist, by every company. And that's the whole idea of our proposal of the science cloud. The idea is to say we want uh, supercomputing uh, as a service to, first of all, our scientific community, but also to our companies and especially to our SMEs. So to do that, uh, you, you need to link supercomputing uh, with the cloud. You need to link it with the high-speed uh, connections. And you need to link with an ecosystem or applications that are being developed in the various fields, being it fintech or being medicine or being manufacturing. So that's the whole idea behind the science cloud, beyond the ecosystem, beyond, uh, uh, let's say, getting together. So on one side, uh, not being uh, parsimonious with the ambition when it comes with uh, uh, building uh, Europe as a supercomputing power and moving towards the extra scale. 
and having the technology also, because I don't think it's uh, that healthy that Europe doesn't master the basic technology of supercomputing. We do have excellence uh, in terms of uh, 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 complex system. Uh, we do have uh, excellence in understanding uh, 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 parallel computation, no doubt. But we do not probably master it all. And I think uh, this cannot be in the uh, era that we are going to enter. So Europe must master the ABC, must master, I mean, have the excellence and extra scale machine, but shall not lose the uh, uh, concept of federating and working together in diversity, in different centers. That's uh, not to be so, not being parsimonious with uh, ambition, but being absolutely parsimonious with bureaucracy, with ideas of, uh, I mean, doing things which are not necessary. So we have to start from the strengths we have and move ahead. Now, to move ahead, sorry to be, now we are speaking about the very high things and voyage, and, but I mean, to do uh, fantastic voyages, no matter whether to another planet or to build a supercomputer, you, do, you need money, ladies and gentlemen. So let me be a bit crude here. Um, Let's say the European uh, budget uh, so far, the budget of my DG in supercomputing has been not bad in terms of, uh, that we, we managed to line up a couple of hundred million, which is not exactly coffee money, but it's not the money you need for the ambition I just described. That's why our estimation to realize the science cloud and to realize also the next step, by the way, which I speak in a moment, which is quantum computing, uh, we have estimated 5.7 billion euros. You can say 5.6, you can say 5, 6, doesn't matter, big money. But not so big. I mean, uh, the uh, Galileo navigation system is something that Europe will acquire, and it's a 6 billion exercise. So it's the size of a large federative uh, uh, scientific project or a technical project for Europe. We must convince uh, of, uh, decision makers to actually decide to work together, because no member state can afford this, no member state. Those that try to have the national plan for supercomputing and being, I mean, uh, top of the world, I'm afraid to tell you, but that you know, failed. Uh, this is the typical thing that Europe shows is value added. I mean, we need to work together. Uh, and we need to find the financial resources to do that. So, so let me also bring some good news uh, tonight. In the revision of the financial framework, we are getting some support for additional uh, funds for supercomputing. Now, the member states uh, want to cut the budget altogether. I hope after tonight you go there and tell it's not a bad uh, uh, idea. I mean, if you can let's say, save some bureaucratic costs, but don't cut the money for science, don't cut the money for supercomputing. This is our future, our common future in Europe. I'm trying really now to see how much money we can uh, cluster into the existing funds of Horizon 2020, really to make an impact. And then um, we are trying to tell to those member states that want to work with us, I mean, no one is obliged, why don't we federate effort? Why don't we work together? Why don't we have an agreement to work together? Uh, so far, uh, we have uh, had interest uh, from Luxembourg. We have uh, had uh, interest uh, from Spain, from uh, France, from Italy. Uh, we are discussing with other member states. So I hope that uh, we can add uh, uh, Ireland to this list. And I hope that in the coming months, uh, possibly in the setting of celebrating, I mean, uh, uh, 60 years of Europe, uh, we can sign the, uh, the first piece of paper, which is uh, let's work together, uh, which would be a fantastic signal to the whole HPC community that, I mean, the European Commission, the member states are committed, those they want, of course, to work together. Uh, and I must say the first feedback from many, many member states, it's very positive. So I'm hoping that around this crazy idea, uh, which is not so crazy, of the fantastic voyage of being, uh, I mean, in Europe, 
uh, an example for the world in supercomputing ecosystem, we can federate all the countries of praise. Uh, of course, uh, needless to say, we need you, we need your support. And uh, with what I have seen in this video, it's not difficult to convince the ministers. I, I, probably we just have to show the video. I mean, the video is very telling, much more than my speech. So uh, I would end uh, my speech by before you start looking at iPhones and things like this. Uh, um, so uh, by saying, uh, I don't need to convince you how relevant is HPC. Maybe what I try to say is I try to convince you how relevant it is in the changing society we see and how could make the difference between keeping uh, the society as we know it with our democratic and cultural values and also delivering a much more, much more to our citizens. They need to be convinced by the examples we have seen, because this, this, of course, if I tell to someone in the street, uh, supercomputer, they think about a big uh, telephone. I mean, but if I tell them about the advancement in medicine, the advancement in predicting uh, better climate control, I think they understand. People in the street, believe me, they understand. So this is the story we have, we have to say and bring it now to the political table. So I hope that not in uh, the 20th year celebration, but, but we can celebrate uh, in, in few months uh, the start really of a different era in supercomputing in Europe, and I hope to celebrate with all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Director General. It was a very inspiring, uh, certainly, presentation. Uh, I'm sure uh, we'll have many questions or, or comments from, from the floor. I'd like now, it's a great pleasure, uh, again, to uh, invite somebody who is a bit, of a, a bit of a role model for me as well. It's uh, Professor uh, Martin Curley from uh, Maynooth University. And some of you might remember him also from uh, Intel. So Martin kindly accepted to contribute to this event by being our master of, of ceremonies and leading the discussion, so please, Martin. Great, JC. So, yeah, good evening, everybody. Gosh, it's a huge honor to be here, and this really is a, is a celebration. Uh, how great it is, Roberta, to see it's a director general that is really, really knows his brief. Uh, you know, Roberta has a fantastic uh, sort of background. He sort of hit all of the triple helix, you know, from being a research engineer at ESA and then the, the regulator in, in Italy and then you know, being responsible for radio frequency policy across Europe and um, I just want to know what JC's secret is because I don't know when you wrote to, to Roberto, was it you know, a couple of months ago or? Okay, because I used to work very closely with Roberto's predecessor, Robert Madeline, who was a historian. It took me four years to convince him to, to come to Dublin, so. Okay, I have a couple of slides I just want to show as an intro. We have a really, really distinguished panel who I'm going to introduce in a moment. Uh, but I also want to acknowledge some of the people in the room, people like Dennis Jennings, who played such a you know, sterling role uh, behind actually the, you know, the creation and the, the, the survival of, of iCheck and people like Luke Drury, who you saw on the, on, on the video, and there are many other people in, in the room to acknowledge the great contributions of actually all the staff at iCheck. Um, you, know, you might have heard the story, um, overnight success on average takes about 10 years. And I think that really is true of um, iCheck, because just in the last couple of weeks, there's been you know, really strong uh, acknowledgement of iCheck's contribution to, to Ireland. And IBEC have just you know, recently awarded uh, uh, iCheck their uh, Outstanding Academic Achievement Award. And it was also a personal award for uh, JC uh, from the French ambassador uh, being awarded a you know, very uh, prestigious uh, award of, you know, a Chevalier de Lord uh, de Pam Académique. So uh, congratulations to JC and, uh, and the team on that. Uh, so just to make some, some brief uh, introductory comments, uh, we live in a time of great uncertainty. We obviously know there's political and policy uncertainty, what's happened in the UK with Brexit and uh, going into the, the Trump era. But arguably, I think there's actually even more uh, technology uncertainty. You know, never before have we seen, if we looked in the past, there was one disruptive technology that arrived and it changed everything. 
But now we are seeing just a wave of disruptive technologies coming together, whether it be cloud computing, so a very small company can have the same capability as a very large company, whether it be big data, whether it be the Internet of Things, whether it be blockchain, whether it be exascale computing, they're all arriving together. So there's tremendous technology uncertainty, and the half-life of a company in the Fortune 500 continues to drop, 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 because there's, there is so much change. Who could have imagined you know, that um, Uber or a player like, like that that really doesn't own any assets uh, you know, could be a very large player? or I think we're all familiar with Airbnb, the largest hotel chain in the world in, in just a couple of years. So very big changes uh, enabled by technology. I'm going to introduce the panel in a second, but I just wanted to do some positioning in the context of what we're thinking in Ireland. And um, I don't know if Orla Quinn is here, the Secretary General of DJI. Well, well, welcome, Orla. I don't know if it's Dermot Mulligan is here. Uh, no, Dermot wasn't invited, but hugely important and, and uh, really pleased to see you, Orla, here, just your, your commitment to this. As we think of Ireland moving forward, Innovation 2020 is a hugely important strategy. In the past, we had research prioritization. But as we move up the maturity curve, uh, the next thing that we need to focus on was an innovation strategy. And now Ireland has a very, very coherent, very comprehensive approach to what are we going to do in, in, in innovation. I think it, we need to even move beyond that and have a coordinated technology strategy. And Orla, I'm not looking for a new job here, but I think in the future we need a, a CTO for Ireland that could really help orchestrate that and, and drive this forward. So thinking about the context of Innovation 2020, there are kind of two views we can take off you know, from a high performance computing. And we're going to be push, putting this question to the panel. You may have heard the expression, you know, to outcompute is to outcompete. Is that necessary? Or could we take an alternative view that we don't necessarily to be a leader in the in high performance computing hardware and in the, in, you know in the top 100 of the top 500? But should we be a leader um, in the use of high performance computing? So just to think about this is something that we're we're going to um, you know, put to the panel. Uh, there is increasing evidence, and actually what Trinity uh, professor contributed to this that you know, research we have made bets in in, in research recent report and. Basically, it shows consistent investments in HPC at even model, modest levels are strongly correlated to research competitiveness and a corresponding increase in research funding and publication counts. So I think that's quite significant. Now, it doesn't talk about innovation impact, but that is the next study that needs to be done. Uh, interestingly, the correlation between the capability of machines that are purchased in the, the, um, with the investments and the indicators of research competitiveness is positive but less strong. Uh, so consistent investments is, is particularly important so that you, you stay at the table. Lots of research being published uh, around, uh, particularly in America. Uh, we are now in an arms race uh, where the top two computers, uh, high performance computers, are now Chinese. And we have equivalent capacity between the US and China. And being on the, the West Coast very often, that is a message that is not, not going down uh, too well um, in the US. But lots of evidence uh, around HPC being a force multiplier for American innovation. Uh, I want to take one example and, and make it very personal. You know, Roberta, you talked about this. Uh, but if we think about healthcare as a, as a domain that's going to be totally changed, there's a paradigm where it'll change from moving about you know, making sick people better, it'll be about keeping well people well. And Roberta, you, you, you talked about this. So um, there's a whole body of work around value-based care that Michael Porter has been writing about from, from a Harvard, uh, you know, Harvard Business School. Uh, but if you think the other things are going to change, computational power, it's, it's just growing exponentially. The capacity on, on this year's top 500 list is 60% greater than last year's list. So there is incredible growth, incredible actually uh, uh, revenues for the, the companies that are, are supplying into that. Reduced sequencing costs, Roberto talked about this. I'm going to show a chart on that. And then machine learning, everybody's talking about machine learning and, and deep learning, and people are investing you know, very um, heavily in this and, and, and the opportunity to um, use this. You know, I myself, you know, when going through some treatment in one of the hospitals here, a radiologist missed something on a scan and it was, it was very difficult and you know, a machine can do that better than a, a radiologist. So there's tremendous opportunity. But if we look at the sequencing uh, costs compared to Moore's law, it's dramatic, dropping even more dramatically than uh, than, than Moore's law. And to tell a story, Eric, some people know Eric Dishman, he was one of our pioneers at Intel when I was there in terms of thinking about healthcare transformation. But he was somebody, you know, great executive, but for 20 years he suffered from a chronic cancer condition. And when um, sequencing sort of came into the tens of thousands of, of dollars, he was lucky enough to, to um, have his DNA sequenced. 
And uh, what they found when he worked with his medical team is that 97% of the treatments that he'd been having for the last 20 years were making him sicker, not better. But they were able to focus on the 3% uh, that uh, made him better, and now he's doing fantastic. In fact, he left Intel, and uh, he's now running a very big trial for the US government in healthcare. So it's just one personal story around how what's happening here can you know, really be, be, be life um, changing and, and for Eric, the big thing uh, for him for 20 years, he wasn't able to. He loved Oreo biscuits, but he would eat them, but he couldn't taste them. And then, you know, when he got this uh, treatment, this new treatment, he was able to taste them. And of course, the possibility of reimagining the possibilities with big data analytics. And you know, JC is going to have a hard question in terms of on the on the panel around high performance data analytics. And um, the director general talked about this sort of you know the collision of high performance computing and cloud and HP HPC as a, a as a service. So uh, tremendous uh, opportunities available. So um, the ambition of Ireland in Innovation 2020 is to be an innovation leader. Um, I was privileged to be on when Commissioner Gagan Quinn was responsible for research. She, she put together a high-level group that worked on a European Innovation Scorecard. A very distinguished panel of people like Henning Kargerman, who was CEO of SAP. And uh, we worked with the University of Maastricht, a guy called Professor Hugo Hollanders. And a new instrument you know, came out, the European Innovation uh, Scorecard. It, it, I certainly believe, is the most sophisticated instrument on the planet in terms of actually measuring inputs, intermediate processes and outputs in terms of innovation performance, a very useful instrument at looking at national um, innovation uh, performance and ecosystem and where you need to make um, interventions. Uh, so Ireland today is actually an innovation follower, uh, which is actually a reasonable place to be if you look at what we can spend. And you know, thankfully, the government and successive governments have maintained you know, commitments uh, to, to spending on infrastructure. But if you look at us as a high performance computing player, you know, I deliberately made the, you know, the, the text very small, but we're way over on the, uh, my right of this, this screen in terms of actually looking at our capacity uh, you know, compared to, to, to other countries. And this is something we'll just discuss in, in the debate. Um, so I wanted to ask the question, I've had the privilege a couple of times in my life to, to meet with uh, Professor Stephen Hawking. And on this occasion, we were able to celebrate a couple of things, his 70th birthday, but also um, the, the launching of the first European computer that used the, the, the Intel uh, Xeon Phi. But next year, I wanted to ask you the question, who will have a bigger computer, um, supercomputer, um, Ireland or the University of Cambridge? Anybody guess? Well, Cambridge, you know, petaflop of GPU, petaflop of Intel Xeon, petaflop of um, Intel Xeon Phi. And by the way, there'll be four other UK universities that will have bigger systems than, than Ireland. Uh, I had the opportunity a couple of years ago, well, probably four or five years ago, to participate in an exercise uh, with the UK government, and they published um, a UK uh, HPC strategy, and I was able to meet with the chancellor. Uh, George Osborne, and two weeks later, lo and behold, he announced uh, massive investment um, in e-infrastructure. E so one of the things that we, we are missing in Ireland is actually a national uh, HPC strategy. So uh, we have agreement with the, the Irish Academy of Engineering to work on a national policy document for all of Ireland on what should we do in HPC. And you know, Professor J.C. Despa has, has agreed to participate on that. We'll be working with experts uh, from the, the, the all of Ireland and actually some international experts to put together um, a national HPC strategy. We'll be working with DJI, and we hope to meet with Michael Noonan. So I don't know if it'll take two weeks to get a result like with the, with the UK government, but, but we'll see. So uh, to, as a setup for the panel, I think our collective, we have a collective challenge. You know, how can HPC uh, help with innovation 2020? And in those few focus areas where we decide as a country we want to be an innovation leader, how can it help? So the challenge, I think, for all of us and, and the panel is like this. So how can we imagine the impossible and then deliver the incredible? And I really believe that that's possible. <laughs>